Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Welcome to everyone who is joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So again, if you have a Bible, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5, looking at verses 6 through 11. So does anybody here ever experience anxiety around the possibility of your phone dying, like when you might need it the most, right? We, we use our phones for everything, and there are these critical moments where it's like, if this thing goes, I... I don't know what I'm going to do. And there are people here who live on the edge, meaning they live on the edge in that they never fully charge their phone. Their phone always exists at like 20% charge. Anybody do that? Any crazy people here do that? Anybody married to somebody like that? And it just drives you nuts. You're like, come on. All you have to do is plug it in. Well, a couple years ago, I was driving uh, from church after a Sunday service to a pastor's retreat up in a camp north in the, the state of Wisconsin at Camp Four Springs. And I had never been there before. This is my first time going there and left after church and had about a four-hour drive or so to get there. The way that you get there is you go up to Stevens Point, you connect to Interstate uh, 39, go up to Wausau, and then it's about another hour from Wausau. And it's in the middle of nowhere. Like you want camps to be in the middle of nowhere, and this one was definitely in the middle of nowhere. Never had been there before, didn't know where I was going, and as I was driving, I was catching up on all sorts of digital content, listening to uh, podcasts and listening to music, and by the time I hit Wausau, which I still have another hour to go, I grab my phone and I look at it, I'm like 10%. I'm like, oh no, like I'm going to need the navigation once I get off the interstate, and so I go and I grab my charger to plug it in. And my car is an older car, so it has one of those like round, like 12 volt ports that kind of looks like a cigarette lighter, but it's not really a cigarette lighter. And I go to put my charger in there, and I can't like get it in. And I'm wiggling it around, and I'm trying again, and I'm just really, something's not right. And so I look in it, and the reason why is there's a nickel that one of my kids had shoved down <laughs> in it. And I'm like, what? What am, I, what am I gonna do now? Like, I need this port to charge my phone and I don't have enough power to get to where I'm going and I need my phone as a navigation tool. So I pull over and I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I, I close out all my apps on my phone. I turn off my navigation and I start to use my Google Maps as though it's a paper map meaning I plug in the address, I see the route, I look just for my next turn. I'm like, okay, my next turn is there. So then I close out my phone, I put it aside, I get to my next turn, I take that turn, I pull up the phone again, I plug in the address again, there's my next turn. Okay, I'm gonna go there, put the phone down, and I repeat that for the whole way there. And each time I pick up my phone, like the power is going down. Is that 10%? Is that 9%? And I'm thinking to myself, if, I, if this thing dies, I'm out of luck because I have no idea where I'm going and it's starting to get dark. But fortunately, the whole way there, I, I got there with like 2% left on my phone and I was relieved. So the interesting thing is sometimes we don't appreciate power until it's gone, right? We, we don't have this appreciation of power until it's no longer there. And when we see power decreasing or declining, our impulse is to grab and to hoard and to maintain and try and conserve power as much as we can. And, and this is true not only in a physical sense with technology, but it's also true in a social sense because our society is obsessed with power. Everybody's trying to get power, to maintain power, to climb some sort of power ladder. And the reality about power is that it's a whole lot more fragile than maybe we realize. And truth be told, power is a whole lot more fleeting than we sometimes realize. Because the truth is, even the most powerful people in the world will someday have to face their own mortality. And at that point, death is the great equalizer, and you're not as strong as you think you are. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're finding yourself in some sort of struggle or wrestle for power and you're not sure what to do. And the best thing might be to actually let it go. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I'm, my life is absent of power. I don't have any, whether it's socially or in relationships and 
maybe that's an actually, that's an okay place to be. Because maybe you have the ability to receive something that's better than power. And if you're here this morning and you're wondering why in the world you would let power go or if you find yourself in a place where I just want a little bit of it, I think our passage this morning speaks to why it would be okay to let it go and what you can receive when you do. Now, for reference sake, we're jumping into the middle of Paul's concluding remarks on the topic of justification. So we're going to look at verse uh, 6 through 11, but I'm going to start reading at the beginning of chapter 5 and give us the context of where we're jumping in. So this is Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. And then our passage today, verse 6, starts in this way. You see, at just the right time. Have you ever been in a moment where it seemed to come just as the right time? But sometimes we call those moments coincidences, but there are these moments where it's like, oh, je- that happened just at the right time. Like if you're stranded on the side of the road, your car breaks down, you blow a tire, you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't know where to go, you don't know what you're going to do, and then at just the right time, your friend happens to pull up behind you and say, hey, can I help you? Or if you're out in the community with your family and one of your kids start to have a medical issue that you've never experienced before and you're not sure what to do and they start to collapse, but there's a medical professional who's also out in public at that point and they come to your age, you're like, oh, at just the right time. Now, one of my favorite Greek words in the New Testament, oddly enough, is the word time. That might be a Greek word that uh, seems kind of strange. Like, why would he really appreciate that word? Because in part, it's because it's a word full of nuance. Like in English, we miss that nuance. We have just one word for time. It's the word time. But in Greek, there are a couple different words for time, and each carry with it a little something different. So, for example, one Greek word for time is the word chronos, chronos time. And chronos time is time that we measure sequentially, right? It's time that we find adding up minutes, adding up to hours, to days. It's time that we measure on a clock or a calendar. The other Greek word for time is the word kairos. And if chronos time is measured by sequence, kairos time is measured by impact. It's those moments where it feels like time stands still. It's it's those moments in your life that could change the course or the trajectory of your life. It's one of those moments that leaves a lasting mark. And after that moment, it's as though you will never be the same. And oftentimes, Kairos time is marked in our life with some sort of memento or keepsake or something to help us remember. Like I have this little shelf in my office that has a little rock that's painted to look like a ladybug that helps me remember a moment in my life. I have another rock that has the word yes on it that helps me remember another moment in my life. I have a bracelet with my name on it that helps me remember another moment in my life. And then I have this picture. This picture sits on my desk that helps me remember that moment. That picture was taken when I was a youth pastor, serving one year in ministry, and we went on a youth trip, a mission trip to Mexico. And we went to this camp located just south of the border in Mexico with Azusa Pacific University. They own this piece of property, and they put on a camp every summer. And youth groups from all over the country would go to Mexico. They'd stay on this camp. And then throughout the day, they would go into the community and serve. And so we served at a church all week long and would come back to this camp in the evening and have meals and do Bible studies and have worship services. So one of the last days of the trip, 
the church where we were serving put on this little worship service for us. And so we went there and engaged in the worship service. And this is a kid named Jose who I met that week. And he and I, like, we didn't speak the same language. And so we would joke with each other through the week. And he was a kid who was kind of on the margins of their community, kind of known as a little bit of a troublemaker and a prankster. But during the last night of our trip there, during this worship service, we're singing a song, and he came right up next to me. And we were singing the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And somewhere along the way, he started singing it in Spanish. I was singing it in English. And then he nudges me as he's singing it in Spanish, inviting me to copy him and try and sing it in Spanish. So I would sing a line in Spanish along with him. And then I got him to sing a line along with me in English. And we were going back and forth. And it was this really sweet moment. Somebody else on the trip, one of the other youth leaders, saw it happening, took a picture of it, framed it. It says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, on the top. Yo quiero verte on the bottom. We want to see you. And in that moment, I was reminded and taught that God's family is way bigger than people who look like me. Way bigger than people who speak like me. It transcends cultures. Because he and I had a really hard time communicating all week. But in that moment, it was like, oh, we, we were brothers in Christ together. So that picture sits as a keepsake for me to remember that moment in my life. That would be marked as kairos time. Sometimes we call them kairos moments where it feels like the kingdom is crashing into our lives and it arrests us and it's like God is trying to get my attention here. And so when Paul says, at just the right time, he's saying at just the right time. Kairos. It's a moment in your life that is going to never be the same after that moment. And what Paul is doing here is he's painting the picture of Kairos time, a Kairos moment, a moment in time where your life is standing still and it's marked by desperation and helplessness. It's a moment when you're in over your head. You're staring at a situation and you realize there is no way out. I don't have the ability, the capacity, the intuition, the know-how. I am powerless. Because he says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless. It's a moment of powerlessness that he's trying to capture. And really what he's referring to here is a moment in time when we have awareness of the depths and the severity of our sin. Have you ever had one of those moments where somehow you get this real, honest, unfiltered look at your own heart and you're like, oh, like that? is in there? Like sometimes we're really good at hiding those things, right? If it's a conversation you're having in your head about somebody else, and if anybody ever like was able to tune into that conversation and what you were really thinking about that other person, they would be like, oh, you, like that? Because we all have those thoughts where it's like, I would never say that out loud, ever, right? But it's there, right? Or those moments when you look at people who are in need, And you see, like, I actually have something that could meet their need. But you think to yourself, but I don't want to give of that to them. I want to hold on to that for me. We call that greed. And that exists in there. Or sometimes it's the perceptions that we have about other people based solely on their ethnicity. And we realize, oh, yeah, I I do stereotype people. Yes, there is racism that exists in my own life, when we have those moments where it's like, oh, that is actually in me. So the question for all of us is, what is that for you? Do you have those moments? And in reality, sometimes those moments are hard to come by because we live in a world that doesn't think much in terms of sin, We explain sin away. We think sin is this archaic reality from prehistoric times or the ancient world, and we're modern people. We've progressed. We've better ourselves. We've better our society. And so, therefore, sin is a thing of the past. And so, sometimes it's hard to have 
great awareness of what our heart is really like, in part because our society doesn't think much about sin, but also because we're really good at excusing it, aren't we? Like when it does surface, when we do see it, and it is reflected back to us, we're really good at excusing it, denying it, justifying it, saying there is a reason for it. But God's hoped-for response in your life, when you get an honest look at the severity of the sin in your own life, is that it would bring you to your knees and that you would cry out to him because you recognize there is nobody else but him who can rescue me from this place. And even that is hard to do because that means we'd have to admit that we're powerless. And we don't like to do that. We don't like to admit that we're weak and can't do it. We live in a culture that says, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You should be strong enough. If you do it enough times, you will become competent. Paul is saying, at just the right time, at just the right kairos, when we were powerless to do anything about the sin that exists within us, the picture that Paul is painting here is that we as humanity are ungodly, are powerless to do anything about it, and at some level, unworthy to be saved. Because this is what he goes on to say. This is the rest of verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. See, what Paul is doing with verse 7 is he's using it as a setup for his main point, which comes in verse 8. And the implicit question behind both his setup and his main point is, who's worthy to be saved? Who is worthy to be saved? And he's saying very rarely would anyone give of their own life to save a righteous person. The implication behind that statement is if anyone would never give their life for a righteous person, surely somebody wouldn't seek to save and rescue somebody who is an unrighteous person. That would be ridiculous and seem to be crazy. Then he gives a little clarification in the second part of verse 7. He says, oh, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But again, emphasizing the point, but no one would dare to die, sacrifice their own life, or give of themselves to save somebody who is unrighteous. But then here's his main point, verse 8. But God, which might be one of the best phrases in all of Scripture, but God, right? And what that phrase is, is a contrast phrase. A a phrase saying when we were still powerless, when, when we are unable to fix our own situation, when we can't clean up the mess that we've made, but God can. Where we were powerless, God is powerful. Where we are incompetent, God is capable. But God, verse 8, demonstrated his own love for us. It's one thing to have somebody say to you the words, I love you, right? But what we really want is to see that demonstrated, It's one thing to hear those words, but we've all been in situations where talk is cheap. It's really easy to tell my wife, oh, honey, I love you. See you later tonight as I leave out for the day in the morning. But if I never give of myself, if I never prioritize her over myself, if I never go the extra mile to take care of the kids and give her some time to herself, if I never offer to make dinner or run errands or plan an evening out for us, if I don't show my affection in any way, she's going to start to think, he's full of it. He doesn't really love me. He just says it, and that's about it. It's one thing to say those words. It's another thing to demonstrate them. And what Paul is saying is that God demonstrated his love for us in this, while we were still sinners. He died for us. See, the main point that Paul is making is that God has every reason not to rescue humanity, every reason not to. 
Humanity, he's saying, is ungodly. Humanity has turned their back on God. Humanity lives in rebelliousness, trying to be their own God, do things on their own terms. And in just two verses, he will say, humanity was enemies. We were enemies of God. Right? Humanity is continually in this place of rebelliousness and hostility, not living in accordance with God's ways. And in ourselves, we're deficient. Like we're one big hot mess. And we don't have the ability or the power to do anything about it to rescue ourselves even still. But God, he demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think one of the places where you, you see this beautifully in literature and in storytelling is in the, the movie or the story Les Mis. There's a scene at the beginning of the movie that I think perfectly captures this idea of somebody giving of themselves for somebody who is unworthy to be saved. If you've never seen the movie or seen the play, it's a story about a prisoner named Jean Valjean. And Jean Valjean is in prison at the beginning of the movie and is quickly released at the start of the movie. And the rest of the story is what happens to him after he becomes a free man. And when he's released from prison, he has nothing, right? He's spent who knows how many years in prison. He's a disheveled man. His life is a wreck. He has nowhere to go, no one to take him in, and he meets a priest. And a priest offers him a place to stay. He takes him into his own home. He allows him to get clean up, cleaned up. He gives him a fresh pair of clothes, gives him a warm bed, a roof over his head, and serves him a hot meal. So there's a scene in the story where they're having this meal together. And during dinner, Jean Valjean, this ex-con who's just been released in the world, starts to notice all of the valuable possessions that the priest has. And he starts to craft a plan in his mind of what he's going to do when the priest goes to sleep. And so they go to bed that night. Jean Valjean wakes up in the middle of the night and he steals all of these valuable possessions. He puts them in a bag and he's out of there. He's gone. He takes off. And it doesn't take but a few hours for the police to catch him, ask him what's going on, ask him about the things that he has, and realize that this man is an ex-con who is staying with the priest who stole all these possessions. And so what they do is they take Jean Valjean back to the priest. And there's this scene where he's now confronted with the man that he just robbed. And he's got all of his possessions in front of him, and the police are asking questions. Is, do you know this man? Did he rob from you? And the priest says, oh, yes, yes, but Jean Valjean, those, yes, those are my things, but you forgot to take something else with you. And he goes back inside, and he grabs two more valuable possessions, and he says, here, take these as well. See, what the priest could have done, should have done, and says, that man is a scoundrel and a rat. Throw him in prison where he belongs. He is unworthy to be set free. He is an unworthy man. He has squandered his freedom. He at very least could have said, yes, I forgive you, put him in prison. He could have said, I forgive you, let him go free, give me my stuff back. But he said, oh, keep those things. And here, let me give you more. It was a moment of love that was demonstrated by this priest to an unworthy individual. And the, that, that all happens in like the first few minutes of the story. And the rest of the story is about how that moment and that encounter with the priest changed Jean Valjean's life. And he, because of that moment, became a completely different man, a man of compassion and kindness and grace. See, Paul's point is this, that when we were unworthy to be saved, Christ died for us. He says that Christ demonstrated his love for us while we were sinners, while we were powerless, which means Paul is trying to communicate that God's love is power to the powerless. If you are here this morning and you feel like I'm striving and fighting and struggling for more power in my life, whether that be social power, spiritual power, whatever kind of power, perhaps the best thing you can do is stop striving for power and open yourself up to the love of God, knowing and believing and trusting that his love is power in your life. His goodness and his grace, because when you are given an amazing gift that you, don't earn, you didn't earn or deserve, it 
has the ability to change you and make you into a completely different person. And that's what Paul is saying the gospel does for us. The gospel is the God's love on display for the world, for those who are in need to say it is power to you who have none. And then as you move through the last few verses of this passage, Paul quickly states, and here's what his love does for you. Here's what his power in your life does for you. The first thing he says is it brings justification. Then he says it brings salvation, and then it brings reconciliation. He says this in verse 9, since we have now been justified. Right? We said this is Paul's concluding remarks on the theme of justification. He's saying, since we've been justified, and what we're saying justification is, is simply a declaration from God over your life that you are in good standing with him, that you are in a right relationship with him. And the good news about that is it has nothing to do with your spiritual performance. It's a declaration that is not based on the merit of your spiritual performance, but on the merit of Jesus' death, because he goes on to say, since we have now been justified by his blood, Jesus' death on the cross and his life is given for you so that you might be viewed in a way to be right with God based on what he has done not on your own merit. And not only does Paul say that we have been justified, not only do we receive justification, we also receive salvation because he goes on to say, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Since we have been justified, how much more will we be saved? So salvation is this really big topic, right? But we can think of salvation in our lives as something that has happened in the past, Right? When I was regenerated and I went from spiritual death to spiritual life, it's something that is happening in the present as I'm being made new and being more and more conformed to the likeness of Christ. But it will also be something that happens in my life when Jesus returns and all things are made right. I have been saved. I have, am being saved. I will be saved. And here Paul's saying we will be saved from God's wrath, which most scholars say that this is a wrath that's kind of looking to the future. Sometimes we have this perception that God is this angry ogre in the sky. And whenever you put God's love and God's wrath next to each other, sometimes it confuses people. It's like, well, which is it? Is he a loving God or is he an angry God? Is he really compassionate and full of mercy or is he just waiting to strike us down? Which is it? And sometimes we have this vision of God being like this angry toddler who just walks around stomping on things, knocking over things, but then has a mood swing and is okay. But I think sometimes we misperceive God's anger because we don't really understand this idea of God's future judgment. Because one day we will all have to stand before God. We will all have to give an account and it's not as though God is furrowing his brow and he's erratic in his anger right now, but rather what the scriptures tell us is he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger, meaning he's patient with us. There will come a day when we will have to stand before God, but in the meantime, he's patient with us. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to give us moments in life that cause us to wake up to see who he is and what he has done so that we would admit that we're powerless receive the love of God, and then for those who have received his love, and we are justified in the here and now, we don't have to fear the day of judgment because we can rest in the righteousness of Christ and what he has done in the, on the cross and the life that he is bringing us into. God's love and his power justifies us. It brings salvation into our life, and then lastly, Reconciliation. Verse 10 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? God's love brings justification, salvation, and reconciliation. Reconciliation is access to God. We have free access to God in the here and now. Paul says in verse 2 of Romans 5, we have been saved to the point where he says that we have received access by faith into this grace. He will say something similar in Ephesians 2. We have received access to the Father. You know, my kids have access to me at any moment. At any moment. I have a number saved in my phone that is the girls' school. 
And every, I don't know, few weeks, it's like I get a call from the school. And when that number pops up, you bet I answer right away. Now, nine times out of 10, it's something trivial and insignificant. It's Lucy has a loose tooth and she's a little worried about it. And so she goes to the office and the office is obligated to call me. And so she's like, she's fine, but we just need to let you know. And so every time the phone rings and I see that number, I'm like, is it going to be a loose tooth? Is it like, you know, is it something insignificant? But they have access to me. And no matter what I'm doing, I stop everything and I pick it up because they have access to me because I'm their dad. And that's what we have with God. It's not as though we're bothering him. It's not as though we're interrupting him. He desires, because we are his kids, to give us full access, to open the door, to allow us in at any point. We have been reconciled to God. And I think what Paul is trying to capture here is he's trying to capture just how amazing this is, right? He says twice in these last two verses, how much more? If having been justified, how much more will we be saved? If having been reconciled, how much more will we be saved? How much more does God need to lavish his love and demonstrate his love for us to understand what he thinks about you and how he perceives you and how much he loves you? Because God's love is power to the powerless. Which then raises the question, if God has gone to such great lengths, To demonstrate his love, how is it that we should respond? And this is what Paul says to end their passage in verse 11. Not only is this so, but we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. See, when, when someone comes along and they do something for you, that you can't do for yourself. It naturally brings boasting, not in yourself, but in them, because you have this awareness that you are deficient, but they were able to do the thing that you couldn't do. Last summer, our family moved to a new house, and we stayed in the same neighborhood, but moved seven blocks, and so one of the things I did that pastors often do is they recruit people from the church to help them move, right? That's kind of one of the benefits of being a pastor. So I recruited a group of guys from the church, but then there was this neighbor down the road and lived like three houses down, a young kid. His name was Trey. Trey is 17 years old. He's probably now 18 years old, and he is like a brick house. Like the kid is huge. I mean, I have to look up to him. I could jump on him. He he could like carry three of me around, and it would be no problem. He is huge. And when we moved, he was the unsung hero of the move. I mean, everybody was singing his praises because if there was something that we couldn't lift, we're all like getting to be old men and we have to be careful of our backs and and how am I going to feel in the morning? Like Trey would just come along and like pick up things and start pressing them and walk through the house, right? The worst thing to move when you have to move is your washer. You have to get it from the basement and in Tosa Homes, it's these tiny narrow staircases and you got to get it down the basement. I mean, everybody's like, Trey! Hey, come help. And right away he was there and everybody was singing his praises. Like I bought pizza for everybody who helped us move. I paid him money. Like I was so excited <laughs> that he was there. He was the only one who got paid from me, right? We were rejoicing and boasting in him because he was doing things that we couldn't do because of his power, because of his strength. God's love is that power in our lives. And so the question is, are we going to position ourselves to receive it and then simply rejoice and boast? Because that's what the call of this passage is, to rejoice and boast, not in ourselves, but in God. And what if each day this week we started off our day rejoicing and boasting in God? If you're anything like me, I step into my day and I start thinking about all the things I have to do and whether or not I have the resources and I have the time and I have the ability to get these things done. But what if I were to start my day and rejoice in the fact that God has done something for me that I can't do for myself? What if we were to simply start our day with a prayer that says, Lord, I need you? And what if it was just a one-sentence prayer? And what if it just happened to be this prayer, right? And this is a prayer that you could, you could take out your phone, you could snap a picture, I'm sure we'll put it on social media. But it's just a prayer that each morning we start our day and we say, Lord, I rejoice and my powerlessness, trusting your love to make me strong. That's what, what Paul will say at the end of 2 Corinthians 12. He'll say, I, 
I rejoice in my weakness. I boast in my weakness because in my weakness, through Christ, I am made strong. And I wonder what happens if a whole church starts to recognize that. If we have the humility to name our weakness, if we have the humility to name our mistakes, if we have the ability to name our shortcomings to the point where we say, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. And I wonder if the community around us would start to be drawn to Jesus if we have the ability to represent him in that way, saying, I have been reconciled to God through Christ. And if you don't have the resources to do what you need to do, the love of God is available and present to you to help you do that. Because it's in those moments when we recognize our powerlessness, the invitation from God is to come rest in his love because his love is the power for us who are powerless. So may you see that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And may you have the courage to admit your powerlessness. And may you trust that his love will make you strong. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the message of the gospel and the spiritual power that comes with it. The spiritual power that is in that simple message that has resonated from one generation to the next. Lord, we confess this morning that we don't have the resources, that we don't have the ability to do the things that only you can do, that we don't have the resources to rescue ourselves. And so, Lord, we look for you this morning to be our Savior, to be our God, to be our King. We pray this in your name. Amen.